Hello everybody, this is Dr. Guccione from the Academy of Online Radiology Education. I am a junior editor from the University of Texas at Houston and I got another collection of good articles for you this month in September and thank you for joining me. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to recognize these four wonderful senior editors who have made this process possible. Thank you to them and everyone at the ACOR team. Okay, this first article I have for you this month is titled Comparisons of Imaging Findings Between Acute Focal Bacterial Nephritis and Acute Pyelonephritis. As the title kind of explains itself, they wanted to see if ultra ultrasound could differentiate between these two things and how they compared to CT. 11 children were selected who had a urinary tract infection as well as a contrast enhanced CT and an ultrasound which were both performed within a 24 hour period. There were eight patients who had acute focal bacterial nephritis and three who had acute pyelonephritis. And what they found was that on ultrasound, there was a significant difference in corticomedullary differentiation between the two groups. Um, eight out of eight or 100% of the acute focal bacterial nephritis patients had a loss of corticomedullary differentiation, while they saw that in none of the acute pyelonephritis cases. These areas of abnormality corresponded with hypoenhancement seen on the contrast enhanced CT. And the other features they looked at were not significantly different between the two groups. This next article I have for you includes one of our senior editors, Dr. Aya Kamaya. And they wanted to look at how contrast-enhanced ultrasound affects the long-term clinical management of indeterminate renal masses, um, not just the diagnostic utility of identifying the mass. So they had 215 renal lesions, which were present in 157 patients, and they selected patients who had chronic renal disease or a nephrectomy and had a contrast-enhanced ultrasound prior to any treatment. They compared malignancy and surgical rates after a contrast-enhanced ultrasound was performed. So you can see I broke this down here. They had the 215 lesions, which broke down into 61 lesions where they recommended follow-up in the radiology report. Um, and none of those 61 lesions were later suspicious um, for malignancy or malignant themselves. The other 154 lesions, they recommended surgical intervention or no follow-up. The surgical intervention was in 24 patients, 21 of which out of the 24 patients ended up being malignant for those lesions. The other 118 lesions out of that 154, um, recommended no follow-up, um, also we, they called benign. So their conclusion was that a contrast-enhanced ultrasound had strong utility in the long-term clinical management of um, indeterminate renal masses, not just the diagnostic utility of initial diagnosis. So this is a really interesting article looking at pseudogestational sac and other classic signs described in first trimester ultrasound. So the idea is that many of these were described in the early days of ultrasound. And since then, um, we've had significantly improved resolution of machines and different techniques. And they wanted to see if those signs, if these signs are still relevant today. So in a retrospective manner, they had 649 sonograms with an interuterine sac-like structure and had no yolk sac or embryo. To be included, the patients could not have an extra ovarian adnexal mass, which would be suggestive of an ectopic pregnancy. And they also had to have follow-up information to confirm the location of the pregnancy after this initial sonogram. So they recorded the presence or absence of an echogenic rim around the collection, which was seen in 92% of patients, an interest decidual sign, which was seen in 54% of patients, and the double sac sign, which was seen in 28% of patients. Now the kicker is that all 649 patients had a later confirmed intrauterine pregnancy, i.e. none of these ended up being a pseudogestational sac. And their conclusion was that many of these classically described signs may not be relevant today, just given advances in ultrasound. And it's something we need to consider going forward. So this next article is looking at contrast enhanced ultrasound and how it fared against CT or MRI in LIRADS observations, um, LR3 and above or LRM. So they had 273 nodules in 239 patients. They did have pathology for comparison in all of the lesions. 
And what they found was that between the contrast enhanced ultrasound and the cross-sectional imaging, the intermodality agreement was fair with a kappa of 0.319 and a significant p-value of less than 0.001. So I have the positive predictive value in this table down here of the different observations for contrast enhanced ultrasound and CT or MRI. And on the other one, I have the sensitivity and specificity for LR5 observations and LRM observations between the two different modalities. So they concluded that their, the positive predictive value is comparable for LR5 lesions, and it also looks like it is for LR4 lesions as well. Um, however, CT or MRI is better for diagnosing LRM malignancy, which is non-HCC malignancy than contrast enhanced ultrasound is. All right, so this next article we can dive into is looking at gastrointestinal stromal tumors and liver metastasis and see if those can be identified and differentiated on contrast enhanced ultrasound from colorectal cancer liver metastasis. So this is important because occasionally some of the first um, indication or first um, diagnosis of gastrointestinal stromal tumor is by liver metastasis. So what they had was 160 patients with liver metastasis, 80 of which were gastrointestinal stromal tumor and 80 of which were from colorectal cancer. And they found that on um, grayscale ultrasound, the gastrointestinal stromal tumor metastasis were significantly different um, in that they had hypoechogenicity, mixed echogenicity, or an anechoic area associated with them. The contrast enhanced ultrasound of the gastrointestinal stromal tumor metastasis were different because they had capsular enhancement, washout at greater than 40 seconds, and a non-enhancing proportion um, of the lesion which was greater than 20% of its size. And what they, they also combined these sonographic features with laboratory biomarkers like CA125 and CEA, and adding those in, the sensitivity and specificity of gastrointestinal stromal tumor liver metastasis increased to 70% and 97.5% respectively. For this article, which was published in Radiology this month, they looked at two different ultrasound contrast materials, sulfa hexafluoride, which is a purely intravascular agent, and perfluorobutane, which is a ultrasound agent which is uptake by the Kupfer cells, um, which allows for liver parenchymal evaluation. And they wanted to see how these two compared for um, evaluation of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients who are high risks. So they had 59 patients who had Lyrides observations of LR3 or greater. And what they found was that mild and late washout, which was greater than or equal to 60 seconds, was more common in the perfluorobutane than it was in the sulfur hexafluoride um, with a p-value of 0.04. With the perfluorobutane, because it is uptake by the Kupfer cells, they found that hypoenhancement was more common in malignant lesions with 92% than in benign lesions, which was seen in 33% of those. The sensitivity um, for these for hepatocellular carcinoma was 79% for the perfluorobutane and 54% for the sulfur hexafluoride, and the specificity was 100% for both. So they concluded that the diagnostic utility of perfluorobutane was improved over the sulfahexafluoride. So this is an interesting article in interventional imaging, which is pretty straightforward, but there are a lot of numbers. So if you need to stop um, the video, please do. They really just wanted to see how three different methods for performing TIPS were compared for um, outcomes as far as complications and times. And the three different methods used for TIPS was the transabdominal ultrasound guided approach, the fluoroscopic guided with wedge hepatic portography, and the percutaneous portal vein guide wire approach with fluoroscopy. And they had 264 patients mixed between these groups. And you can see in this table below that summarizes everything. There were 54 in group one, 172 in group two, and 38 patients in group three. So I, they looked at fluoroscopy time, total anesthesia time, contrast volume, and the number of needle passes through the liver. 
And you can see the different times here. There is the significant differences in this table here. The, insig the differences which were not significant are excluded. So you can see for fluoroscopy time, the second group had a longer fluoroscopy time than the third group. In the total anesthesia time, the third group had a shorter and a total anesthesia time than group one and group two. For contrast volume, you can see the difference here that was significant. And intrahepatic needle passes, group two was significantly greater than group one and group three. So what they concluded from this information was that A, if the complications from group one and group three were pooled, group two had more complications and it was significant. For the other conclusion that they came to was that groups one and three may have shorter um, and fewer complicate shorter duration and fewer complications um, as far as that approach being performed uh, than group two. And finally, this is a straightforward article looking at lung ultrasound findings in patients with COVID-19. They had 28 patients split evenly between men and women um, who had a positive test and lung ultrasound. And what they found was that all patients had abnormal lung findings and all patients also had uh, B lines. Uh, 19 patients or 67.9% had consolidation on the ultrasound and 17 or 60.7% had thickened pleural lines. They also found that the thickened pleural lines was associated with longer disease duration, um, which was significant, and that consolidation was more frequent in severe cases. So lung ultrasound, they concluded, may be beneficial in monitoring um, and diagnosing patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. And that is all I have for you this month. Thank you for watching and for following us at the Academy of Online Radiology Education. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn if you haven't already. And I look forward to seeing you back next month.